Hello. Sure. I'm, I'm ready on this end. Yeah. Uh, I could not see you on screen. Hi, good yeah. morning. Hi, hi, hi. Good morning, Jeshwa. Good morning, all of you. And on behalf of the organizing team of Anamol College of Education, I extend a warm welcome to today's speaker and the audience. Anamal College of Education is a government-aided teacher education institution established in the year 1962 and a state-of-the-art infrastructural facility in South Tamil Nadu. Our college has crossed several historical milestones and is committed to uplift women by giving them professional higher education. The pandemic has affected global citizens and due to which schools and colleges are closed worldwide, and we are giving online education to students and we come across several hurdles in that. I attended an online workshop where Dr. Joshua Jodine was the speaker and I found that he can give practical ideas for our online teaching and hence I asked him to give a presentation in our webinar for Indian teachers and he has accepted my request. Thank you Dr. J for your generosity in giving a presentation for us in spite of your university births. The speaker is a native of Canada and is teaching in Japan. Dr. J is currently a lecturer at Konan University, Japan, and a recipient of a PhD from Koyata University's Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies, focusing on education for sustainable development. He has previously worked at Kwansky Gakuen University the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China, and Wilkent University in Ankara, Turkey. He earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Calgary, finished the Cambridge Diploma of the English Language Teaching to Adults, and received a master's degree in educational management from the Wilkent University. Joshua's current interests revolve around environmental education, education for sustainable development, and English as a foreign language. He has published a number of papers in peer-reviewed journals. In this workshop, he will discuss on how online teaching is different from emergency remote teaching. Thank you very much, Dr. J, for giving your concern to present in this webinar. I thank my colleagues, Vinodini, Tangaselvam, and Emima, who are a great support to organize this workshop. Dear participants, we want to give something different from other webinars, and so we have arranged this. We thank you all for joining us. There will be more takeaways from this workshop and have the best use of them. Since this is a workshop, you have to be active throughout this one hour. I request all not to ask for feedback link in between the workshop session. It will be shared only at the end of the workshop. Welcome you all once again. And now over to Dr. J. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very, very much for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Uh, Sharmila Azarai, I hope I pronounced that correctly, for organizing today's session. Um, a couple of things just before we begin. So a huge, huge thank you to everyone uh, for showing up today. Uh, it's exciting to see this many people uh, this early in the morning, so I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you might be wondering a little bit about my name. Um, my parents, for some reason, really liked J's. And so my name is Joshua John Joden, JJJ. My brother is also uh, Jamie Joseph Joden, JJJ. Uh, so to make it easier for my students, I just get them to call me Dr. J or Mr. J. So when you're talking to me today, Dr. J is totally fine. Um, when we're talking in the chat uh, or when we're talking hopefully afterward, on Flipgrid. So this workshop today is really about uh, all of us being suddenly thrust online uh, this past semester. And we've never experienced this in our lives, but a global pandemic is really going to reshape the way that us educators are teaching our classes. So today, I really want to talk a little bit about these ideas of what online teaching are and what emergency remote teaching is. 
And I, I'm going to emphasize a lot on emergency remote teaching. If, if you've never heard that term before, that's okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then I'm going to offer some handouts um, at the end or throughout the session and you will be able to do your own research a little bit later on. So today, one of the goals for me, um, and Dr. Azara mentioned this, is I really wanted to make this as interactive as possible. Which means I'm going to be using several different tools and I'm going to be getting you, the participants of the workshop, to be actually doing things. So please participate as much as you can. I understand that some people have limitations uh, in terms of maybe you're using a mobile phone for today's session. Um, that's okay. If you can participate, great. If you can't, no worries. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end to uh, join our Flipgrid discussion and to participate there if you're not able to. Um, so a huge thanks first off to those people who have already jumped on Flipgrid and produced a video. Uh, I really, really, really appreciated uh, some of those videos that have already been up there. Thank you to those brave individuals. Um, we will be talking a little bit more about Flipgrid as we go along. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we are going to, oops, hang on one moment here, let me just, okay. We're going to be talking about quite a few things. So um, this idea of emergency remote teaching, like I talked about before, uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that. And then I'm going to talk specifically about two tools today on top of Zoom, which most of us are using today um, and I think are familiar with after this semester. Uh, Google Forms. If you're not familiar with Google Forms, that's okay. Today I'm going to give you some ideas of how to use Google Forms and uh, why you should consider using it, especially in the fall. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about Flipgrid. Um, those people who have made a video or checked it out already have seen a little bit of it, um, but hopefully by the end of today's session, uh, you're going to be brave enough and interested enough to jump on and play around with it a bit on your own. So before I begin, I probably should just spend a little bit of time uh, learning, well, for you to learn a little bit about me. So we're going to play a quick game called Two Truths and a Lie. How this game works, uh, it's very, very simple. I'm going to give you three sentences about myself, and you have to figure out which sentence is the lie. Now, uh, I'm going to be giving you a Zoom poll to do, excuse me, uh, right after this. So you will be able to answer this question directly on your screen. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, so let's take a quick look here. First question, Dr. J is a recent graduate from Kyoto University in Global Environmental Studies. Dr. J has been teaching English for over 12 years at the university level. And Dr. J is originally from Canada, but now lives in Tokyo. So here is what I would like you to do. I'm going to put a Zoom poll up on your screen. You should see that right now on your screen. Please choose which one you think is the false sentence. I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to do that now. We've got about 140 plus participants in today's Zoom. So this should take a couple of minutes. Again, if you're just joining us, there's a poll on the screen. Which one is not true? Is it A, B, or C? Okay, everybody, I'm going to give you another 20 seconds or so, 20 seconds to complete the poll. All right, last five seconds. Three, two, one. 
All right, so I'm going to end it there. So what I'd like to do is share the results of this poll. So uh, the vast majority, well, no, it looks like it's actually pretty even across the board. Um, but most people believe that A is false. So let me just talk about this really quickly. Uh, in fact, A is true. Uh, I am a recent graduate from Kyoto University. And my focus or my interest is global environmental studies. And I'll talk a little bit more about my interests in a bit. Uh, B. Dr. J has been teaching for over 12 years at the university level. This is true. Uh, I started teaching at the universities. Uh, I lived in Turkey for four years where I did my master's degree. Uh, and I was able to teach at a university there where I focused a lot in assessment and language education. And then I taught in China at the University of Nottingham, which is a British university. And now I teach here in Japan, and I've been here for uh, just over five years. C, uh, Dr. J is originally from Canada. That is true, but I do not live in Tokyo. I live in a city called Kobe. Uh, Kobe like the basketball player. Kobe, Japan is actually just outside of Osaka, and that's currently where I teach. So C is the one false answer. Now, I wanted to show you guys a little bit about Zoom polls because Zoom polls are very, very useful ways and functionality in Zoom um, for online teaching. So if you're interested in doing this kinds of things, uh, a lot of this, please, I'm going to give you some documentation in a bit, but you can learn more about polls from uh, a couple of different websites. And I'll share that in a minute. So a little bit more about me. My research is really focused on sustainable development, specifically the sustainable development goals. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen those in and around uh, your city, your town, or possibly online. And then language teaching. So where these two places sort of meet. And I've created a new field that's called Language Education for Sustainable Development, or LESD. Now, today's workshop is not going to be focusing specifically on my research, um, but certainly I will be giving you some more information about it. And if you're interested in any of the publications I have, or you want to learn more, um, there is going to be some information I will pass on a little bit later. Okay. So here's the first thing I would like everyone to do right now. Um, on your screen is a Google form survey. I'm going to stick the link in the chat window for those of you that can't. For those of you that are on mobile phones, for example, uh, you can quickly use your mobile phone and use an image from it and you should be able to follow the QR code directly to the website. So I'm going to give everybody a minute or two to fill this out. This is an opportunity for me to learn about who you are, the 160 of you. The survey should just take a couple of minutes and you should be able to access it both on a computer or on a mobile phone. So uh, please go ahead and do that right now. Of course. Idi, a class for the webinar, then Atnan sold down, bro. Let me send that through the chat one more time. Now, again, uh, if you are on a mobile phone, uh, hopefully you'll be able to take a screenshot using it, using the QR code, or simply follow the link that you can find in our chat window right now. That would be great. After we start getting in responses, I'm going to show you uh, the responses instantly as they are coming in. Okay, I'm going to mute myself for a quick minute. I'm still around, but uh, please go ahead and fill out that survey right now.
Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you all for submitting. Uh, please continue submitting if you haven't already. All right, so on your screen right now, uh, you are seeing sort of an instant feedback from the survey as respondents are coming in. Now, this is a very, very powerful tool, uh, Google Forms. Uh, I use this quite often and I show my students um, as these surveys are coming in. So what's really, really interesting is we can see that uh, we've got about 45 respondents now. You can see the respondents here as they are coming in. Uh, it looks like the vast majority of people, of course, are from India. Um, how many years have people been teaching? Here we can see a wonderful little breakdown. And if you click on each individual box, it sort of shows you um, how this works. So the vast majority of people are new to language teaching. We've got the second amount of people are very experienced. And I know this from some of the people that submitted on Flipgrid. We have uh, several professors or teachers at the university level that have been teaching for years and years and years, which is great. So we have a real collection of people that have been teaching for very little time and a lot of experience. And we've also got a wide range of people in between, which is really, really quite wonderful. Let's have a look at Google Forms. So what we're seeing here is clearly uh, most people are somewhat familiar with Google Forms, which is wonderful. Um, if you are familiar with it and you've used it before, personally, for what we're doing right now, uh, doing the suddenly emergency remote teaching or online teaching, this is a ridiculously powerful tool. It is very, very helpful for all sorts of reasons. And, Today, I'm going to model some of those. So the people that have, know a little bit, this is a good opportunity, hopefully, to learn some new tricks today. Um, hopefully, there will be some new ideas for you to learn about. And for everybody else, some of these new people, hopefully, uh, this is an opportunity for you to start exploring and looking into it. Flipgrid, it looks like the exact opposite. Um, which is great. So hopefully today you will have an opportunity to use Flipgrid, see how it works. And then after today's workshop, I have some homework for you. I actually want you to go and create a video on Flipgrid. I will explain that in more detail in a moment, but um, this is really, really great way to enter into it. So those people that aren't as familiar, Hopefully today you will learn a little bit about it. Now, this is always a really, really great thing to have a look at. Um, so we can clearly see that the vast majority of people, it's this sudden shift to being online, which has caused uh, quite a lot of issues and problems. Um, most of us were teaching person to person just six, seven months ago, and suddenly we're introduced to all these new tools and stuff. And this is really what I'm gonna be focusing on quite a lot today. Uh, we also have a lack of knowledge of online teaching and the tools that are there. And of course, um, this is something that, you know, uh, even the reputation in Japan is that we have this amazing internet system and this high technology but even here in Japan, we've had a lot of students that have had, um, don't have access to good computers and or are having Wi-Fi issues for whatever reason. 
So uh, we can see that this is a common problem, uh, not just in your country, but also in the country that I am registering from. And we've got lots of uh, amazing food here, uh, vegetarian food, masala rice, all of these delicious things. Um, Indian food is one of my favorites. Um, so anyways, I thought that would be kind of fun to see which ones came out on top. And I'll be having a little bit of a look at um, any questions and things to cover here in a minute. Okay, uh, right now, what I would like to do is I am going to, through our chat window, I am going to give you the handout for today. Now, if you're on a mobile phone, it might be a little bit more difficult for you to get this handout. That's okay. Uh, we will make this handout accessible afterward. So don't worry if you don't have access to it. Um, I just stuck it in our chat window. Um, so if you can, please have a look at the handout, download it. And uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about this today. Let me just briefly introduce you to the handout. Uh, it basically covers some of the areas we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm gonna be making several points of online learning and emergency remote teaching. We're gonna talk about Google Forms, Flipgrid. And if you haven't already, here is the Flipgrid address for this session only. And this is the password to get into that Flipgrid. You must use capital E, capital R, capital T, small teaching 2020 to get in. So it is case sensitive. There is a workshop survey, which I will talk about at the end. It is accessible here with the links and also a QR code. And then down at the bottom, you will notice that we have several resources. A lot of these resources I use to put together today's workshop. Some of these resources, for example, these are about my background and my publications in language education for sustainable development. And then I've also included a couple others like using polls in Zoom. So there are some, hopefully some very, very useful information there for you to use. Again, uh, if you don't have access to it right now, that's okay. I will try and get it to you um, again afterward. Okay, I'll just throw it in the chat window one more time for those people. Please check the chat. You should be able to see it there. Okay, thank you very, very much everyone uh, for filling out the survey. Let's move on. Now, I was telling you earlier, we have to really be conscious about what we are doing this semester. And we have to be good to each other and good to ourselves. Emergency remote teaching is very different from online teaching. And I've been hearing this a lot. Most people believe that online teaching is what we are doing this semester. And I'm here to tell you that it really isn't. So let me explain first, and then uh, we can talk about some of these details. So this is from uh, Natalie Milkman, and this is actually from her Education Week article, which you will find in that handout that I sent you. Now, at the top, in the black, it says, it takes a lot of time and effort to design and develop effective, engaging online education. Now, time and effort. This semester, we've suddenly been thrust online. Of course, we are all working very, very, very hard. Dr. J, no uh, sorry doubt. for the interruption. Yes. Uh, people are saying in the chat box that they could not receive the uh, file. So they say that share file seems to be disabled. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay, I will uh, try to fix that or at the end of the workshop. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What we will do is I will, uh, I have another survey for people to do. And if they give me their email addresses at the end, I sure. will send that to them. Okay. Okay. Yes, you can continue. Fantastic. Okay. So again, online teaching. When we think about online teaching, I want you to think about like uh, websites like Coursera or edX. Now I've taken courses on those websites and they are very, very involved. 
They've got pre-recorded lectures. They have um, wonderful assessment tools, wonderful interactive tools. All of these things are built into their online education. We are not doing that. Uh, to do an edX course, it might take six months to develop that course. So the blue and the red is what we are actually doing. We are suddenly thrust online. We are doing emergency remote teaching and it's not ideal. So it's not the best well-planned or quality instruction. And that's okay. We have to give ourselves a break. So let me explain this in a bit more detail. Now, let me go through these points. So online teaching takes a lot of time and effort to design and develop engaging, effective online education. Again, think edX, think Coursera. People have teams of 10 people that are developing these courses six months before they start, right? Imagine 10 people working on an online course for six months before it starts. This is not our experience, right? So effective, engaging online education. Of course, we want that for our students, but we have to be gentle with ourselves. We do not have teams of 10 people and we are not preparing for six months. It's meant to be a long-term solution, of course. It is not urgent, right? So it is planned, it is methodical, again, a pandemic is not planned or methodical. It changes it. I do have a school. Of course. Um, it has full faculty support. So this is a really important point. When we talk about faculty support, we are referring to people at our university that can help us with these types of things. Again, they have a team of 10 people, maybe one IT guy who just looks after IT problems, one person that's a curriculum designer. Again, we are not doing this. And students are voluntarily enlisting. When you sign up for an edX course, you are signing up for a very involved, detailed course. This is what we're doing this semester. We are doing emergency remote teaching. So the difference is, let's talk about these a little bit. This is activated in response to a crisis or something beyond human control. COVID-19, the pandemic, is beyond our control. We've suddenly been thrust online, right? Like the survey that we talked about on Google Forms a minute ago showed, most of you have struggled with suddenly going from face-to-face -to, -face to online. It's meant to be temporary. Of course, we are going to be um, pushing towards face-to-face -to -face eventually, but this could take a year or two. We don't know yet. So it is meant to be temporary, but for the foreseeable future, for the next year or two, emergency remote teaching is what we are going to be doing. Lacking resources. My university suddenly switched to online and Usually we have access to an IT person, but they were so busy dealing with Wi-Fi problems, getting students computers, trying to figure out those issues. They couldn't help us design courses. So we had a real lack of resources at our institution, as I'm sure you did with many students having problems. Maybe they don't have computers. Maybe they're using just mobile phones, maybe Wi-Fi issues. We need to figure out systems that work for us, even with the lack of resources. Faculty support, again, is probably limited. That's been my experience with my university here in Japan. And the students had no choice. Um, one thing that my heart really went out to this past semester is I have a lot of first year students, undergraduate students looking at me and the first thing they wanna do is they wanna interact with their peers, right? They want boyfriends, they want girlfriends, they wanna meet people, make new friends, and they're stuck online. They don't have a choice in this. So we wanna create as best courses that we can, but we have to be realistic about it. We have to 
We're not going to create an edX course or a Coursera course. We have to be kind to ourselves and think about our expectations. So that really is the difference. So we are doing re emergency remote teaching. I want everyone to remember that, especially when you start designing your courses for the fall, because this is really what we're doing. So what can we do to make this better? Well, we need to communicate frequently and honestly with our students. We need to let them know if we're having Wi-Fi problems or we're trying to figure something out and it's not working, be honest with your students. Um, they understand that we are in a challenging situation and we need to continue, of course, letting them know what we're up to, what we're working on, and then letting them know that they're engaging in this experiment with us. We want to try a new tool and we're not sure if it's going to work very well. We need to be open and honest with our students. We have to prioritize the needs of our students. Um, this is something that was very challenging for me at the beginning. Um, I coordinate a larger course. Um, it's a course called Global Challenges and it's focused on the sustainable development goals. Uh, and it's a language course, of course, so there's a lot of support for um, learners at the lower levels of language. And I've got a lot of part-time teachers that work on my course. And at first there was just too much stuff in the course. It was set up for an online, or sorry, face-to-face -face system. So it overwhelmed the teachers because they were trying to do too many things online and it overwhelmed the students. After the first unit ended, we cut out chunks of the course and we really tried to prioritize what is going to work for our teachers, what is going to work for our students. So again, we had to take out some of the material, which I was a little upset about because I had worked very hard on it, but it was much, much better for everyone involved, right? Students could access those materials easier, we set up systems online that worked better for them and the teachers weren't as overwhelmed with the amount of work that they had to do and to get through. So prioritize needs, be flexible. Just like I mentioned, we had to change the entire course, right? And make it work for our students and make it work for our teachers. And this is really, uh, it was difficult at the beginning, but we had to do it. Keep it simple. Now this is our, something that I learned a lot about this past semester. Um, if you can figure out ways to simplify the assessments, simplify the assignments for students, even simplify the classes so that we're talking about classes that are synchronized, maybe half the classes on Zoom and the other half is independent work, asynchronous. So the students are doing that on their own with of course clear instructions from you but creating simple activities that students can do and accomplish in that time frame is much better for students. And this one I also found very useful. Um, I have very particular routines that I use in every single class. For example, I use Google Forms for attendance at the beginning of class, and it gives me a chance to ask questions to my students and get instant feedback about the homework, about how they're doing. And this is a really powerful way to um, keep the students so they know what's going on. They learn those systems very, very well. And then it runs very smoothly uh, throughout the rest of the semester. And this workshop is part of this last idea. We need to make sure we collaborate with other people. So again, I'm gonna hit this hammer as many times as I can or beat this drum Flipgrid afterward. Please jump on there. Please make a video. And it's a way for us to continue this conversation afterward. I hope that this will be valuable to you, but I really want to learn from you as well and for us to learn from each other. So that is a really good platform to try out uh, these ideas and share our ideas with each other. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about Google Forms. So, Google Forms, it sounds like most people are familiar with Google Forms, which is wonderful. Um, I'm going to experiment a little bit today with Google Forms and hopefully I'll be able to show you some new tricks, 
or give you some new ideas to those that are experienced with Google Forms. And those that are new to Google Forms, hopefully today will be a nice introduction. So it, it sparks some interest and maybe you'll be able to jump online and be able to do something with it. So immediately off the bat, I'm throwing it back at you guys and I've got a quick quiz. Again, the quiz can be done uh, using the QR code. So if you've got a QR code reader or most cell phones these days, if you just point your camera to the screen, you should be able to uh, jump online and do this very, very quickly. The link is also in our Zoom, you should be uh, the Zoom chat. So you should be able to jump online very, very quickly and get that. Okay, I'm gonna log uh, off for one moment. Please go ahead and do the Google Forms right now. Finish the survey and you should be able to get instant feedback from this survey. All right, see you in about a minute or two. Okay, um, if you see the screen, please jump on and complete the quiz. Uh, of course, this quiz isn't worth any real marks. <laughs> so if you get the questions wrong, that's okay. No problem. Please do the best you can. But this is sort of a demonstration of what Google Forms can do. All right, I'm going to give everybody another minute or so. Please go ahead and jump online and complete that quiz right now. All right. As you can see on your screen, I'm just showing what I'm looking at. So, so far we've got 25 responses to the quiz. You can see at the bottom what the grades are so far. Okay, it looks like we've got a couple of perfect scores, which is brilliant. All right, I will start talking about this when we get about 40 respondents. So a couple more people. Um, we actually have now we have 190 participants in the Zoom meeting, which is incredible. Thank you all for coming on. Okay, so we've reached that 40 mark. Let's uh, have a quick look here at what we've done. So the first question, uh, what does ERT stand for? And the vast majority of people have got it right. ERT, emergency remote teaching. Now, if you wrote in emergency remote teaching and it did not mark you correctly, Google Forms uh, allows you to insert what sentences you think are acceptable. Now, uh, this is not always perfect because you can never guess uh, how many different answers students will come up with or spelling mistakes, for example. If you've got emergency remote teaching in some form, you've got the question right, even if it marked you wrong, that's no problem. And one of the things that's really powerful about Google Forms is actually you can go in afterward and you can remark things. So for example, this student here has got emergency remote teaching. They capitalized the E, but not the R or the T. So it did not give them grades. And I can actually change that. So I can give them a mark um, and change their grade in real time. Now, what's really, really great about something like this is you can actually use this for marking and correct things after the fact, which is really, really a wonderful tool. Um, so what kind of teaching are people doing this semester due to COVID-19? Most people have responded online teaching. 
This is not the correct answer. And I, I can't stress this enough. Online teaching is, again, something where we've got a team, a large team of people all working together, and they're developing a course for six months before the course goes online. So we really are doing emergency remote teaching, or ERT. We have suddenly been thrust into this this semester. So we are trying to do the best we can. Uh, the quality of our courses is never going to be as good as an edX course or a Coursera course. Um, a course that a lot of people have spent a lot of time developing in advance. So again, uh, if you take away anything this semester or from this workshop, please, please, please make sure that you are kind to yourself. You realize that we're doing emergency remote teaching, right? It's not really online teaching and we are doing the best we can with the tools that are available to us. Okay, which is true about online teaching. The vast majority of people got it right. Again, it takes a lot of time and effort to design, develop effective, engaging online courses. We have not had that time. We do not have six months or four months to get ready for an online course. We've been thrown online suddenly. So, uh, it's really, really important to be kind to ourselves and to consider that we are doing emergency remote teaching, not online teaching, and to understand the limitations and our expectations of that. Yes, I am currently in Japan. Uh, thank you guys very, very much. I'm from Canada. A couple people got that wrong. And my Research focus is Language Education for Sustainable Development, or LESD. Again, uh, I'm not going to be talking about that in any detail today, but if you're interested on the handout, there is some information about that. Okay, thank you guys very, very much for completing that quiz. Now, why am I giving you a quiz all of a sudden? This is because I want you to try out the tools that are available in Google Forms. I use quizzes a lot in my classroom. They're relatively easy to set up and the students can get instant feedback. I mentioned earlier this idea of synchronous and asynchronous. So think about synchronous as being when we're our time on Zoom. So if your class is an hour, if you're doing half of that on Zoom, the other half can be asynchronous, which can be offline for the students. So there's no Zoom, but the students have work they need to do. Now, one of the things that I commonly done is I give them a quiz or a test on Google Forms. So they have work that they need to do. They go on, they do the test, and they get instant feedback from Google Forms. So again, Google Forms is a very powerful tool for doing what we're doing online. Now, uh, as you can see here, this is giving you an example of what Google Forms looks like. Um, I use this very, very often. My suggestion is if you have a Google account, please go on to uh, do a quick search for Google Forms. And you will notice up at the top, there is a bunch of templates. These templates are very, very powerful ways to be introduced to the tools. Start playing around with it, whoops, start playing around with it and learn about the different templates. There is test or assessment templates. There's contact templates. And there are many other kinds that you could use in your classroom. They're easy to set up and they're very, very fast to deploy for our students. So why use them? It is a free service with a Google account. Uh, I've been using Google Forms now for the last basically five or six years in my teaching, and I found it to be extremely powerful um, and very, very useful. And because it's a free tool, it is wonderful for people who maybe their universities don't have access to some of the other tools that are available. It's powerful and relatively simple. Like I said, um, learning a couple of basic things. So that quiz that you just did, it took me about 10 minutes to create. 
course, I know uh, I've experienced Google Forms quite a lot, but it shows you how quickly you can create a quiz that you can deploy to your students um, and they can start using that very, very, very quickly, which is really, really wonderful. Now, because we are doing emergency remote teaching, right, ERT, at the beginning of every single class, I use Google Forms for attendance. And what I'm basically doing is getting the students to write in their names, their email addresses. Um, and then I usually collect information. So I have a simple question or a multiple choice question or a short answer question about the homework. So what did students learn from the homework, for example? Or did they enjoy the homework? And I can set it up like a survey. And then I often have question at the bottom. You know, do you have any questions about the course or anything you want me to answer today? And oftentimes, if a student had problems with the homework, I get a lot of feedback about that. So two or three students will say, this didn't work for me or I was having problems. And this is an opportunity for me then to answer that question for everyone in the class. So these surveys at the beginning that are built in with attendance are very, very useful. I use it in all my classes and it takes about five minutes at the beginning. Once the students know it, I show them a QR code, they immediately go do the attendance very quickly and then I can give that feedback, like I said, at the beginning of class. So very, very useful for all sorts of things. It's mobile and computer ready. So again, we're struggling uh, with a lot of students that don't have computers at home or they're having Wi-Fi issues. Um, mobile phones nowadays, smartphones are readily accessible everywhere in the world. They often have their own internet, which is cheap and accessible. Um, my understanding is that India has a lot of cheap ways to access the internet. So even if a student's using a mobile phone, they can join your Zoom class and they can also do these surveys very, very quickly and efficiently. So it's set up to do mobile or computer and it's easy and it's set up. So this is something that, that Google should be given um, a lot of credit for because it is a very powerful thing. And like I mentioned, it's quick to set up and it is quite easy to deploy and to use in your classrooms. So that is Google Forms. Again, there's a template gallery and there are many pre-made examples. If you're new, go and play around with these. Uh, do some learning on your own. I will also have some links at the handout later on and this should give you some ideas of how you can use it. Google has a very good support page too that walks you through things that you want to do. Now, you'll have noticed that I am using short URLs. Now, you can easily set this up. So on your Google form at the top right hand corner, there is a send button. Now, I, when you push that send button, you can do lots of different options, but I usually just use the link. So I shorten the link URL, I copy that link, and then I usually put it on a PowerPoint. Now, some people have asked me a little bit about QR codes. There are very powerful resources that are free online. Uh, this is one website that I use quite often. Again, this source is, excuse me, on the handout. Um, if you just do a simple Google search for code generator or QR code generator, you will find several of these websites. You put in any link you want and it will give you a QR code that is tailor-made for that particular thing. So putting a QR code on your slide, for example, if you're using a PowerPoint slide, and then also creating a link and being able to put that into a chat window. It's powerful, it's easy. Students on mobile phones can quickly take a picture and use that QR code. Students that are using mobile only can also use that QR code. So it is a very, very powerful way to do that. So, uh, I've got one more poll I would like to share with you today. And this is a little bit more about Google 
forms. So let's just have a quick look here. I'm going to deploy that here in a moment. There are two questions to do on this poll. So I'll give everybody a couple of minutes. You should see it up on your screen right now. Um, the first question, you can choose more than one answer if you'd like. So please go ahead and complete this uh, poll now. Excellent. Wow, the polls are really coming in. So we've got over 40 respondents now so far. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I will wait till we hit um, about uh, 100 participants and then I will end the poll. I'll give everybody another uh, five seconds or so. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you everyone who was able to do the poll. We had about 100 people that responded, which is incredible. So let's have a quick look here at the results. Um, as you can see, it looks like most people are using this for quizzes and tests. Um, like I mentioned before, I found that this is really powerful for using it for attendance. Um, and you can easily go in, you can use uh, one Google form for your attendance, and then you can just change the questions each class. So you don't need to use a new Google form for each class, use the same one, same QR code, same link, just change the questions in real time. So it's a very, very powerful way to do it. And it does look, we've got about 8% of users who have never used Google Forms. So hopefully after today, you will go ahead and uh, use it, learn a little bit about it and try it out. Okay, uh, in terms of the second question, how would you rate your experience with Google Forms? And it looks like most people are in the some experience category, others, so we've got about 33%. Uh, which is the vast majority of people. Very little experience, 26%. I often use it 25%. And we've got about 15% uh, of people that have very, very little time to use it. Okay, so wonderful. So we've got a real extent. So overall, uh, that is Google Forms. Thank you very, very much for doing that. And I really, really hope that today, no matter whatever experience you have, you've learned a little bit about how to use Google Forms and that it will be beneficial to you. Let's move on and talk about Flipgrid. Now, uh, I certainly am not an expert in Flipgrid. Uh, I learned about Flipgrid this past semester from a colleague and I started using it in almost every one of my classes. At my university, I primarily teach undergraduates uh, so we've used it for all sorts of different things. I've used it for book reports where students are able to um, do a video book report where they respond to a couple of questions about the book. So the book title, uh, the rating they would give the book out of five, what they enjoyed the most of the book, and then how the ending was for them, for instance. And it is a wonderful way for students to interact with each other. I, I told you earlier that I have a lot of undergraduate students who are a little bit unhappy about the fact that they are entirely online and not able to make friends. This gives them a chance to interact. So let me talk a little bit about this. This is from the website. It's a free for all educators, which is wonderful. It really does engage and empower students especially this emergency remote teaching that we did this past semester and that we will continue doing next semester. This is a really powerful way for your students to interact with each other and to actually see each other and then to respond to each other's videos. And the responding part is a very powerful feature of Flipgrid, which I will talk about here in a minute. 
So uh, here on the screen is my Flipgrid. And one of the things that I just wanted to show everybody is that you can see clearly, oops, hang on, sorry, one moment here. You can see that I've got several different videos up um, and several different grids is what they're called. Now, a grid is basically a group of people all together online at one place. So let me just show you that in a little bit more detail because my grid has grown quite significantly. And I would like to just share with you um, what my grid looks like and sort of some other things that we can do to use. So first off, I just want to show you um, in my engagement, you'll see the part that's highlighted up at the top. There's been over one week and four days of engagement. So when you think about how many hours that is, that is very, very significant. Here is our tools for emergency remote teaching um, that this grid that I've opened up, which all of you I hope will jump on and participate. This grid is basically um, for you guys to continue the conversation afterward. We've already had 6.7 hours of shared learning. This is including the videos that people have produced and the people, the videos that people have watched, which is really great. I would love to see this get up to 50 hours or 100 hours. So again, your homework, you do have homework after this workshop, is to jump online and to share a video. Now, you can see here that I've shared a video. I'm just going to show that to you really briefly. Now, the videos, once you've signed in, they are Hi, everybody relatively easy to share. And one of the things I would like to do is, is I hope everybody can notice this green button down at the bottom, this big green button that looks like a, a messaging app. This is the reply button. And after you've listened to somebody, it's really, really important to reply to them, to give them some feedback. So I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, Rufus, I hope you're online today. I really appreciate Rufus was kind enough to reply to my video and sent me a message. Flipgrid is really great. It sends me an email when somebody's replied to my messages. And then I have the opportunity to respond to his message if I want. It is a really powerful way. So, I would like you guys to basically answer these questions. I want you to introduce yourself briefly, talk about uh, a fun fact about yourself, your teaching context, because everyone's teaching context is so different. We definitely want to make sure that everyone's teaching context, uh, you, you explain it, talk about what some of the, the difficulties are, what your students are like, what kind of university you're at, and then I would like you to share a tip with the group. So what are things that you're using? What are programs that you found really, really useful? Um, how have you dealt with this ERT, online teaching? Now, if everyone can share a video, then what we can do is we can start a conversation here. What I will do is I will leave this grid open for another two weeks or so. So please jump on, share your videos, and I would like you to also look at other people's videos and respond to their videos. That would be a wonderful way for us to interact and to keep this conversation going. So I will send more details about the Flipgrid uh, link. I saw some people asking for it. Um, and I will also emphasize it to again at the end of our workshop today. So Flipgrid, very powerful resource. Why use it? It is free with a Google or Microsoft account. Uh, and I know that most people are using a Google account. My university uh, uses Microsoft, so I was able to set up an educator account, which is uh, really, really easy and useful. Powerful tools. Again, our students, they are not able to sit in a face-to-face -face setting. This is a really nice way for them to 
learn about each other, to introduce themselves, and to get a conversation going. So really, really great tool for these types of things. One thing that's wonderful, and this is not something I've experienced yet, but I do have some colleagues that are doing it. For example, if you're teaching a speaking course, uh, your students can do small speaking assignments where you can actually make it private so other students can't see their videos and you can give them feedback and create rubrics directly on the service. So, for example, if you want them to um, talk about something for 60 seconds and you're going to give them uh, or assess that video and their speaking ability, you can give feedback directly on Flipgrid if you have an educational uh, account. So this is really wonderful. I've used it for book reports. I've used it for workshops before where we share information with other workshop members. So it is very, very powerful way to use this sort of system. It's intuitive and fun for students. Flipgrid allows you to stick emojis on your screen, words on your screen. Um, students, of course, we, we live in sort of like the TikTok uh, Instagram generation where everyone's creating these videos. Our students are very good at this social media stuff. So without me training my students, they started doing this, they started watching other students do it, and everyone suddenly was creating these really creative videos with um, images and emoji and words. So please, uh, while you guys are experimenting, play around with these functions, have some fun with it so that you can see what it's like for your students and you can learn about it as well. And again, it's got a mobile ready application. This means that it doesn't matter if your students have iOS, Android, if they have some kind of a smartphone, they can download the Flipgrid app, they can record directly from their phones itself, and they can do all those fun functionality things on their phones. So you don't actually need a computer to do this. So very, very, very powerful tool. Um, I'm going to share something with you right now. So what this is, is something that I have used with my class. Now, uh, again, you might, not all of you will be able to see this. I'm going to stick it in the, excuse me, the chat window. Um, but I will also send this out to people that complete the survey at the end. So if you don't have access to it right now, that's okay, not to worry. You will have access to it at the end. Um, now, this is something that I've actually used in one of my classes. And what I've done is um, the students that I have, for those that are familiar with the, uh, I guess they would be sort of beginner intermediate students. So CEFR level B1. And what I've done is I've really clearly outlined what I'm expecting students to do. So the questions that students have to answer to create their own video. And then for homework, I'm assigning them to go and comment on other students' videos, two or three other students' videos. And I give them some clear guidance on the kinds of sentences they can use. This builds their confidence and it pushes them to do it so it's much, much easier. So Flipgrid is a powerful tool. Um, the lesson plan that's there, again, if you don't have access to it right now, don't worry about that. I will, I will make that accessible at the end, okay, after the survey. Okay, so this again is the Flipgrid um, link and the password. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Azarai has passed this on and it will also be available on the worksheet at the end. So if you don't have access to it, that's okay. We'll have access to it at the end. So what I would like you to do is to please log on and like I explained earlier, Please introduce yourself, share some information about yourself, talk about your own context. And when you're ready, there's a big green plus button at the bottom. When you click on that, uh, you will have access to the video functionality and you can create a video, again, either on your computer or if you download the app on your phone, on your mobile phone. So 
please, let's continue this conversation after today's workshop. Okay, so I realize that we are about an hour in, um, and I want to leave a little bit of time for some questions at the end. So I have a couple of closing ideas. Today, we've talked quite a lot about Zoom. Well, not as much detail about Zoom, but I've tried to show you some of the functionality of Zoom. You'll notice that I was bouncing out and then going into websites to show you information. I was also using Zoom polls, which is something that you might want to consider using um, in the future. These polls are a little tricky to set up. You actually have to do it on the website, but there is plenty of information, again, on the handout that I will give you um, and also on Zoom website itself. There is a ton of information there. We've talked about Google Forms being a very powerful tool for emergency remote teaching. You can use Google Forms for all sorts of different things, from attendance to doing quick quizzes to doing sort of asynchronous. So when you are not teaching on Zoom, for example, giving students a clear worksheet, something to do, and then a test or a quiz to test them on what they've done, where they will get instant feedback. Very, very powerful tool for emergency remote teaching. And last is Flipgrid. And again, I'm going to mention the homework that I want to give you all. Please, please, please jump online, be brave, uh, create a small video to introduce yourself, and please comment on other people's videos. <laughs> a really, really nice way for you to share your ideas and then also other people to meet others and to know that they've been listened to. So if you hear something that you think is important, tell that person. Of course, please keep things positive um, and share your knowledge. I really want to learn from you. Um, of course, we're from very different contexts. So I want to hear and learn about what you are doing in your classrooms in India, um, especially. So closing thoughts. Remember that we are doing emergency remote teaching. It's not online teaching. So online teaching as sort of what is the coinage in a lot of the literature. We really are. We've been thrust online from this COVID-19, this pandemic that's struggle, that's everyone around the world is struggling with at the moment. And we really need to lower the expectations a little bit, especially if you've taken an edX course or a Coursera course, we are not able to create that kind of a course. Uh, again, six months and a teams of people that build these courses, we don't have that kind of support. So think about limiting what you're doing, simplifying what you're doing, communicating with your students as much as possible, and being kind to ourselves. Uh, do the best you can. And that's really what emergency remote teaching is pushing us into. There are many, many tools available online. In fact, there are thousands of different tools. I've just showed you a couple of tools that I have started getting very good at, that I'm starting to learn about, and that I feel very, very confident and comfortable with. My suggestion is to limit that scope. If you're already using tools and you're familiar and comfortable, I wouldn't worry about adding too many more things to your toolbox. Try to limit it, get good at a couple of things. You will benefit because you're not going to be stressed about using all these new things and your students will benefit from your experience and your knowledge. So don't overstretch yourself. Um, couple of good tools. Hopefully today you learned a couple of these new tools. Use them if you want, but if you've already got good things that work, I would use those. And of course, find a community of people. People that you can share ideas with, that you can support. Um, I'm very lucky. I've got some very good coworkers that I work with that have shared a lot of these ideas with me. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a good support network 
here in Japan of other teachers that are sharing conferences and things. Uh, I hope that this here will be a good platform for you to learn a little bit from and then for us to continue this community on Flipgrid. So don't forget about your homework. Please do your homework, everybody. Flipgrid is a good place to continue sharing. Again, not everything today is going to be uh, applicable to your context. So share the ideas that work for you and uh, share the ideas that work for you in your context in India. What's working for your students? What kinds of tips have you learned about? What makes it easier for you and your students in this time of emergency remote teaching? Okay, everybody, um, there is a online workshop feedback survey. I'll come back to that in a moment. If you would like the handouts and you would like more information, for example, I will share the PowerPoint slides. You will have access to all of that information through this feedback survey. The feedback survey also is very useful for me. It gives me feedback about these types of workshops to help make them better. Um, and also, you know, I, I know we're in very different contexts, so to make it more context specific. So give me that feedback. And also, um, if you would like, you can share your email there and I will make sure that um, the handouts from today will be accessible to you as well as today's um, PowerPoint. So feedback survey, please make sure that you do that. Um, at this point in time, can we have the link, sir? Can we have the link for this feedback form uh, on the chat? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, one moment. Let me just throw that in right now. There it is. There. Um, it takes about five or ten minutes to do that. So I think what we're going to be doing right now is we're going to do a small uh, sort of question and answer session. So uh, please stick around online if you can, if you're interested. Um, I just want to say again a huge thanks to Dr. Sharmila uh, Azarai, again I hope I pronounced that correctly, for getting things organized and together. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm going to be sharing that handout and things through that feedback survey. So please make sure you do that feedback survey. And uh, just a little bit about myself. You can learn a little bit about me through the links that are here or uh, again on that handout that I will make available. And I'll also put it in the chat window once again. Down at the bottom, there are some links uh, that you can check out if you're interested to learn more about my research specifically. So uh, at this point, I will hand it off to Dr. Azarai. Uh, thank you very, very much. Yes, uh, Dr. J, thank you very much for this enriching presentation. And I hope that there are a lot of takeaways for the participants and they really enjoyed and there are so many questions there in the chat box. Uh, have you seen them, Dr. J, or shall I read out them? Um, yeah, if you could read a couple, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yes. How to share, uh, shall I read the first one from Dr. Tripathi? How to share the forms on screen in real time? Sorry, one more time. How to share the? Uh, forms on screen in real time. The fonts, sorry, F-O-N. Uh, how to share the forms. I think that it is Google Forms on screens in oh. real time. Yes, Dr. Tripathi, are I you see. there? Are you there? Yes, I, I understand now how yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So what, um, what I'm doing to share the, uh, the results of those Google Forms, I think that's the question. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually sharing my screen. So this is, again, functionality in Zoom, and it's something I've learned quite a lot about. Um, how it works is you basically go to the new share button if you're using Zoom in English. And from there, just to give you a quick example, you can share all sorts of things. So you can go in and share one screen if you would like. Now, up at the top of Google Forms, you'll notice that here is where the questions are. So this is the administrator section. Um, if you are doing the survey as a student, you don't see this kind of thing. But if you've created the form on your Google Form, you will have these two tabs up at the top. 
and you can go to the responses. There is a summary section, there's a question section and an individual section. And this is basically what I'm doing. I'm showing the response section and I'm sharing the information as it comes in. And, and Google's really great about preparing charts and graphs. Um, you can also export this as an Excel sheet if you'd like and show your students in that way as well. So there are many ways to do it. Um, sharing screen is the way that, that I've been using to do that kind of thing. So thank you very much for that question. Yeah, one more question from Rakesh Thakur. Can I make an Ask video on Flipgrid? One hour video on Flipgrid. This is the question. Sorry, you broke up there a little bit. One more time if you could repeat one, that. Yeah. Can I make one hour video on Flipgrid? Ah, uh, so Flipgrid does have some limitations. Um, last time I checked, I think the most that you can put on is about five minutes. Um, I think um, I know a lot of my colleagues that are doing longer videos. Uh, they are actually using YouTube to do those types of things. So YouTube would be a good place if you've got something long. Uh, Flipgrid is set up for shorter videos. Um, I purposely limit things to about two minutes just so that it, it challenges students to try to get everything in and it's not very long-winded and it's also easy to listen to, so it's not too long. So um, longer videos, like I said, I don't think they're accessible right now. I don't think that's a functionality of Flipgrid, um, but there is other resources like YouTube where you can do that quite easily. Thank you for your question. Did we lose uh, Dr. Azara? I think we have. Um, so let me just have a quick look at the chat for a couple more questions then. Um, hopefully she will join us here in a moment. Um, <laughs> we've got a question here about the recommendations for the webinar background. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Can you guessing, hear me now? <laughs> yes. I'm guessing that is referring to the background that I've got here, possibly. Uh, it's a virtual background um, for webinars. Zoom, you can create your own backgrounds. Um, I know there is some limitations to computers. So if you've got a much older computer, it may not be able to do a virtual background as such. Um, this is one that I found that was popular online. This, I wish this was my home office. Uh, it is not, <laughs> this is a virtual background that I'm using. Um, but again, you can learn about that online. It's called virtual background. And if you do a Google search for virtual backgrounds and Zoom, uh, you can learn about those types of things. Yes, the question, can you hear me now, uh, Dr. J? Yes. Yeah, uh, the question is, how can we teach reading skill in ERT? Excellent, uh, good question. Uh, reading skills are a little bit uh, more challenging. Um, now, I'm, I'm not a reading expert, although I've been teaching reading for a very, very long time. And I do have a couple of ideas about how I would use it and how it's been deployed in my university. Now, one of the things that we've really worked on is to break up a class into a synchronous section where we're on Zoom and an asynchronous section where we're not on Zoom and the students are independently working on something. One of the things that I've had some success with, um, especially with reading skills or reading activities, is the first half where we're online, I spent a lot of time uh, specifically looking at reading and teaching skills. So highlighting contextual clues, for example, talking about vocabulary and context, working on specific things that the students need to know, and then giving them a reading and a handout, and then tasks that they need to do with that reading that they do on their own. Um, one thing I found really useful is I've actually used the breakout room function in Zoom, so 
created breakout rooms for my students where three or four students go into a Zoom room and they work asynchronously. And then I can jump in and out of those breakout rooms and check on students. So again, uh, they are applying the skills that they're learning, right? Uh, that I've taught them in the synchronous section on Zoom. And then they're in smaller breakout rooms with other students working on these things. And then I can jump in and give them feedback and whatnot. So I think that would be one very useful way to do sort of reading skills. But again, uh, there is all sorts of challenges, especially with reading and writing, which um, again, please share your tips if people know uh, or have a better answer to that reading question in Flipgrid, I would love to hear it or about how to do writing. That would be also wonderful. Okay, uh, Dr. Azara, yes, maybe a couple yeah, more yeah. questions. Uh, Dr. J, can you please share your feedback link again? Because some people are asking for it. Absolutely. Uh, Participants, there are two feedback forms, one for the organizers and the other one for Dr. J. And he would be sharing the handouts and the Flipgrid, uh, uh, your assignment link, etc. Yes. So please fill in two feedback forms. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. J. We had a wonderful time. It is very interactive and it is also thought provoking. And uh, I sh I'm sure that teachers here will make use of these uh, tools, Google Form, Zoom, as well as Flipgrid in their online teaching. Online teaching, or I have to say it as ERT, Emergency Remote Teaching. And uh, uh, now, uh, shall we conclude this session with a formal vote of thanks, Dr. J? Yeah, yes, uh, Tanga Selva? Uh, Mrs. Yes, Tanga Selva? Yes, you can give the formal vote of thanks now. Uh, okay, ma'am. Good afternoon to all. I deem it great honor and privilege to propose the word of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of Panamal College of Education for Women, I thank the speaker of the session, Dr. Jo Joshua Josie, instructor and course leader, Kirara School of Management, Konan University, Japan, for consenting to, the, to be the resource person. The enriching and enlightening experience provided by him about the tools for emergency remote teaching has challenged our thinking and is sure to guide us in our mm -hmm. professional development. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. I also wish to express my gratitude to our college secretary, Mr. S. Morley Daran, and our beloved principal, Dr. Dajin Sharmila, for their motivation, encouragement, and continued support in organizing this workshop. I extend my gratitude and appreciation to all the participants for paying your valuable attention. Thank you, participants, for making this workshop 